Good morning, everyone. Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> I was so depressed. Uh, just hear all these heartbreaking stories is really difficult to hear. But we all know that it's something that happened to our brothers and sisters at this moment. So today, I, w I just wanted to share my personal story. And I just wanted to show how ordinary people are living in North Korea today. So before I start, there are two things that I'm most grateful for. That I was born in North Korea, and then I escaped from North Korea. These events well, shaped my life and made me who I am today. I was born in the city of Haesan, North Korea, on the Chinese border. I could never cross over in the daytime because there were border guards who, with a gun who would shoot me. North Korea is an unimaginable country where there is so much suffering and there's no freedom allowed. But it is also a place of hope because of a young generation, my generation, who have more exposure to the outside world and to the markets. There is a Sangbun system that divides everybody in North Korea. And that is what decides your opportunities and positions in life. You don't have to plan anything, you do, and you don't have to think too much. Governments tell you what to do, what to wear, what to think, even before you are born. Going to school was different there. We were taught that all Americans were evil, and even Westerners, everyone is here, or evil. <laughs> so I thought you guys were all bad. And I could never just say Americans. I had to say American bastards. And I knew only a few countries in the world. America, Japan, South Korea. And perhaps I heard more countries, but I never knew Australia or Switzerland, like this kind of countries. Switzerland, or, and they told us Americans were trying to attack us every moment and we blamed for them everything. So if I was sitting in the room and powering off, I would say, oh, American bastards. And <laughs> because it had to be their fault. So that really became a joke for North Koreans and to believe that. We were taught to watch the great leader, Kim Il-sung, and his son, Kim Jong-il. They were like our fathers and grandfathers. We had to love them because they sacrificed so much for us. I thought our leader could read my, read my mind. One of my first memories, my mother telling me not to even whisper, the birds and mice can hear you. So even thinking was not free in, the, in that country. My older sister and I learned about the Kims in school, but in our house, my father told us something else. When I was seven years old, he told me that as long as you know how to count money, then you don't have to learn anything from school. My father was a party member, and he also had a side, side business doing unauthorized trading with China. In other words, he was a smuggler. I was born in 1993. In 1994, Kim Il-sung, the first Kim dictator died and his son Kim Jong-il took over. But because of Soviet Union, Soviet Union had broken up. Nobody was helping North Korea anymore. Before then, we were given rations, but the distribution system collapsed. So there was a famine during that time, and maybe a million people, or more than that, died for the starvation. I saw bodies on the streets and children literally dying of starvation. Because there were no rations to go around, the only way to survive was a black market. My generation, those born in the 80s and 90s, are called the black market generation, or Madang, our word for market. We had to find our own way to survive by breaking rules and operating markets. 
The main characteristic of, of my generation is that we have been more exposed to the outside world. Even though the North Korean regime is trying so hard to crack down on the outside information, it is always being brought in through media smuggled from China on the black market. Even when I was young, I watched a lot of American movies, like Cinderella, Snow White. The Titanic was a big one. It was a turning point in my life. I, was, I just couldn't believe it. How could somebody make a movie out of such a shameful story? And because in North Korea, everything about the leader, there's no independent newspaper, only one channel on TV, and you are not allowed to listen to any song you want. Nothing but propaganda about the leaders. And, but the Titanic movie, it was not about the, our leader. It was a love, humanity. And the man is dying for a woman. And that was something showing me the different and showing me there's another world. And it also gave me a taste of freedom. Watching the photo media, that was a true joy for me to see us in such a different world, to see how people can express themselves in a unique way. And that wasn't possible in North Korea. In North Korea, the government tells us what to say, what to wear, what to watch, what kind of music to listen to. We can wear jeans, we can dye hair, dyeing our hair, and can dance the way, the way we want. But we watch the movies where people can do whatever, whatever they want. They can express themselves freely. These things are really changing a young generation in North Korea today. They see the movies. They wanted to wear jeans. They wanted to dye their hair. For the media, it's what's, what's setting us free now. So the black market generation is more individualistic and capitalistic. We are buying and selling on the markets. And here's an important point. Once you start trading for yourself, you start thinking for yourself. And that's a big threat to the totalitarian, totalitarian government in North Korea. Markets undermine the Sangmon system where the North Korean puts people into strict classes. Before, the government decides who would survive and who would starve. But the markets that take that away from the government's control. In 2002, my whole world came crashing down. My father, my hero, was got arrested in his black market trading. And he was sent to a labor camp. And suddenly, our lives were destroyed. In North Korea, my father sins my sins. So I'm guilty too. I was a criminal's daughter. There was no way I could have a bright future anymore. My father was tortured in prison camp, and he got very sick. It was colon cancer. But we didn't know at that time he managed, but he managed to bribe later, and he came out to get treatment. But even though he came back, he couldn't work, so we were still hungry. With no hope, with no food, in 2007, our family decided to escape. My sister left first, and my mother and I followed her later. At that time, I had no idea how it would be in China. I just thought it would be have some food, something to eat there, and I wouldn't starve. That's how I was thinking. I was so naive. Things got even worse for us in China. My mother and I crossed a frozen river at night, only to learn right away that we were tricked, tricked by human traffic, traffickers. The Chinese broker wanted to have sex with me when I was 13 years old, when I even didn't know the word of sex. My mother sacrificed herself in order to protect me. I saw her raped in from my eyes. We spent next 18 months in hiding and terrifying of being caught by Chinese police. The Chinese government treat North Korean defectors in China as a criminals. They catch us, they will send us back to North Korea, even though they know that we are going to be imprisoned or executed. 
So we are extremely vulnerable in China. 80% of North Korean women are being victimized of this. And these girls, like me, 13 years old, 15, 20, the girls just like you and me are being sold, sometimes as little as $200. And it's something we have to think about. What can we do here with $200? At this moment right now in China, the girls just like us, like me, are being sold for this money. And not many people know about this, and I believe it's something that has to stop right now. My father later joined us in China, but he was sick, and he died a few months later. So I buried him in his ashes at 3 a.m. in the middle of the night. I thought I cannot live like this anymore. This is not living like a human being. I have got to do something about it. Finally, in 2009, during the coldest time of winter, we joined a small band of North Korean refugees, making a dangerous escape across the Gobi Desert into Mongolia. It was freezing cold, black night, and we couldn't use our compass, so we followed the stars north, walking and, uh, and crawling to freedom. We had hidden small knives in our sleeves to kill ourselves. If we were captured or if we sent Mongolian soldiers would try to send us back to China, there was no going back. Luckily, we made it to Mongolia and to South Korea later. In South Korea, I learned amazing things. They told me all human beings are equal and have rights and have freedom. They told me all human, and also, we are born with the rights that can, nobody can take away from us. And I believe that North Korean people are also born with the same rights that we have now. And to be honest, I admit that when I look at the situation now and the challenge that North Korean people are facing in this moment, I feel really hopeless. And I, sometimes I feel that Dictators in this world have so much power. And whenever we say here, justice, democracy, freedom, or human rights, all these words are too luxury to me. Two weeks ago, I went to San Francisco, and then I visited the Holocaust Museum. And I heard this. Never say there is no hope. Never say. There is no hope. This is a song of Jewish resistance fighters who fought against most inhuman tragedy. There's another tragedy happening right now, today in North Korea. Political prison camps, torture, things the United Nations report has documented as crimes against humanity. Right now, at this moment, hundreds of thousands of people in North Korea are dying from starvation or being tortured. But I believe in hope. I believe someday North Korean people will be free like all of us, using iPhones, internet, laptops, and they will never get killed again for making unauthorized international phone calls or watching foreign movies. This is what is happening right now in North Korea. For seven decades, Kim dictators have oppressed North Koreans, and no, dictatorship, no, no dictatorships gives up power without demand. We must demand that North Korea stop, stop starving their people and oppress its own people and respect their human rights. It isn't just North Korean human rights, but also human rights, our rights, that have violated for seven decades in dictatorships all over the world. Remember, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, Martin Luther King Jr. said. I'm extremely grateful to be here and to share my story. When I was crossing the Gobi Desert, 
I wasn't really afraid of dying as much as I was afraid of being forgotten. That I would not die in the desert and nobody would know, and nobody would know my name or care if I died or lived. But you have listened. You have cared. Thank you so much for bringing hope to my people, and together we can change North Korean lives. Thank you very much.